Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who has given unto us thy servants by the confession of a true faith, to acknowledge the glory of the eternal trinity, and in the power of thy divine majesty, to worship the unity. We beseech thee that thou wouldst keep us steadfast in this faith, and evermore defend us from all adversities, who livest and reignest, one God, world without end. Amen. Well, we're continuing, as is our custom, to work through the Episcopal Hymn Book. We've got about a 99.5% compliance, we think, with biblical biblical canon, which to uh, repeat, in essence, the statement of Athanasius that doesn't measure up to the canon out uh, and that's the view of the church, the supremacy of the canon. Um, we're, we got a 17th century hymn here. We're at Christmas hymns. We're in 95. And Christmas hymns go up to 115. We finished Advent. Uh, Fear not, said he, for mighty dread had sieged their troubled mind. Glad tidings of great joy I bring to you and all mankind. If you're tired of Schleiermachian sermons, just turn to the hymn book for some straight-up food, if you wish. <laughs> Schleiermacher. Existentialism, subjectivism. Anyways, now, while we go on to here, we're trying to, we want to know more about Vermiglii. I think I'm saying that right. Um, there's a lot yet we don't know, of course. Bishop, I'm sorry, Abbott in Naples, that hotbed where they killed a lot of Italian reformers. It's been a while since I saw some sermons and poetry from there, but they were just, there was some Lutheran literature getting down south there. Then he went to Luke, I'm not sure where that's at, and finally, he's, in time, he's up to, to England and with Cranmer. Now, what I've got here uh, is. Old English, so I'm going to be stumbling along trying to read that as we work along. But we're interested in one of the aspects of Peter Vermigli and Thomas Cranmer is the issue of the Eucharistic presence. Um, and this is our hermeneutic here Old Testament exegesis, New Testament exegesis, systematic theology, church history. Practical theology, liturgy, home life, you know, the practical stuff, parish work, ministerial work, home, you know, baptism, Mary, Barry, cradle to grave ministry. But then also we've added contemporary theology. Like here we are talking about Cranmer and Vermiglii on Eucharistic real presence. But what do we do out here in contemporary theology and practical theology? How do I tell the 10, 20, 30 year olds? You know, my children and grandchildren out the other side of the door there about real presence. What does it mean out here in practical theology? And yeah, we can do the sticklers and the details and get into John 6. We were in Bishop Nicholas Ridley earlier today or yesterday. And, he, and then we're also working with um, Alfred's sermon. It's our view here that the Celtic Church before the Norman invasion predominantly held to Elfric's view of the table. That would be an interesting study, but we're working through Elfric's homily for Easter for use in the churches. And Nicholas Ridley um, worked with Berto of Corby, the monk of Corby, a ninth century monk. And I'm not at all convinced transubstantiation was a dominant view. Even up till 1000 AD, I think maybe 1215, the Fourth Lateran Council was really an indication of how much dispute there'd been on the subject. And of course, we get Wycliffe, who, <laughs> who dispatches with that view of transubstantiation until we come down to Ridley and Cranmer, Anyways, I'm talking too much, uh, as is usual, but let's read through this and stop and pause. I call it EOI moments. 
exit off the interstate where you know we're driving along high speed and we need to get off the exit and park the car and stretch the legs get out and take in the what the panorama may need to do that because we want to know where Ver, we know where Vermigli E is in Cranmer but let's hear this august Augustinian abbot turned minister married <coughs> Uh, Dr. Frank James discovers that Vermigla E was close to Fulgentius, Fulgentius of Ruspa, an Augustinian, more than to Kelvin, which is kind of weird. Kelvin was really didn't come into dominance till later, so it was no surprise in my estimation that Vermigla E relied on Fulgentius. It probably also uh, Berto of Corby. But let's see. Um, a discourse of a treatise of Petter, Martyr, Erber, Milla, Florentine, public reader of divinity in the University of Oxford, wherein he openly de declared his whole and determinate judgments concerning the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. The Right Honorable Char Charles Vis Viscount, Viscount, Bruce of Amphill, son and heir apparent of Thomas Earl of Alsbury and Baron Bruce of Warlton's 1712. That's weird. To the Honorable Right Sir William Parr, Knight Lord Parr, Earl of Essex, Marquis of Northampton, Lord Great Chamberlain of England and Knight of the Most Noble Order of the Garter, Nicholas Udall wishes grace and peace in Christ with health, honor, and long prosperity. Now, is this uh, Peter Vermigli writing, or is this a prefatory note? I'm not sure. Uh, perusing the late right honorable and my singular good Lord, a certain discourse, sounds like a prefatory note, of the right excellent clerk, martyr, Peter Martyr, clerk with an E on it, Peter Martyr, written in Latin, concerning the sacrament of the body and blood of Christ, which is of the, can't make it out, called Eucharist, Eucharistia, because it pertaineth to the remembrance of his most tender goodness in redeeming the world. And to the perpetual thanks unto him, therefore, I confess I was with the said treatise wonderfully ravished for first and foremost, whereas by reason of innumerable abuses, detestable errors and foul abominations through the crafty something of the purpurate whore of Babylon by little and little conveyed into the church. There's no point concerning our religion so far and treaked and darkened as the mystery of the sacrament. And that was kind of fun word, mystery of the sacrament. Um, Berto of Corby <laughs> says, if you have transubstantiation, the mystery's gone. It was a clever point and thoughtful. What's the mystery? There's the body right there in the, in the wafer. The sight is satisfied. The ears are satisfied. This is my body. Hocus meus corpum. I guess one of the practical things is that we still have this discussion with Rome and Wittenberg today. We still do with the confessional Lutherans. I don't know about the, the liberal ones. You know, Rudolf Bolton has flown off with the pigeons from the bell tower with classic theology, him and his followers, his crew. But we're not talking about them. And of course, out here in practical contemporary theology, I don't know if the rank and file Roman Catholics still would engage on the subject. The, the scholars and the antiquarians would, but where's the mystery? When you can see it, hear it, taste it, put it in your mouth. You know, eat the toes and the nails and the nose and the ears of Jesus. There's no mystery. According to Corby and Corby, uh, Berto of Corby, and of course he's fighting with Rad Bertus, 
Uh, also, Berto Corby is a defender of Gottschalk's ideology. Although I think Gottschalk's a little later, as memory serves. Anyways, the mystery of this sacrament. And Berto says there's mystery in the Reformed view. Because we have the remembrance and the Holy Spirit brings the communion of the Holy Spirit, communion of the triune God into our presence mysteriously, but very present. It's a mystery how that happens because we don't understand how God communicates with us other than his word and sacrament for our simplicity talking in our ears. We hear it. We see the sign but the reality of the mystery. And that's kind of where I think Cranmer and the Swiss churchmen went to with the Tigerine Agreement, 1549. Anyways, I digress. And in the general council, something so deep in searching and bolting of the truth of the matter, and he maketh it so plain and something evident to all men's, which can either or will see that neither there can be now any further doubting of the verity and truth of this sacrament. Again, I'm reading, trying to translate as I go. It's old English, real old English. What is nor any more be said for the right instruction order thereof how it should be used. Wherefore, methought I could not better employ or bestow my travail than in the translating this tractate into the English tongue. And my understanding is that Peter Vermegli never learned English. He's translated in Latin. He could live, think, and pray in Latin. And when he came into England, 1547, they were using the Serum Missal. to the intent that so profitable a thing might not be hidden from the people, which having both an earnest zeal to embrace the truth and a ready will to follow the king's majesty's most godly proceedings are much hindered and kept back from their desire, partly through ignorance, because they are not duly instructed and taught therein, and partly through the malice of the most perverse papistical leaveners of Christ's doctrine, which to maintain their own and glory cease not as antichrist's own trusty knights <laughs> to, to work as much in them lieth that the simple people may still, and I claim to be out of the simple people, the farm people up in the Canadian the Canadian areas, their Anglicans, you know, is something so beautiful. Up in Uxbridge, farm people coming in from the farms and they build a great big beautiful church where they can worship, be baptized, married and buried, cradle to grave. They weren't scholars at Oxford. They are out there working in the fields. They are running a family business, family farm. There's something beautiful about Anglican churches out in the hinterlands, simple people recognizing the beauty and glory of God and worship and in the Bible, reading of the Bible. Yeah, there's a place for the cathedrals too, like those. Make it still continue in blindness and error, but all praise, all thanks, all laud and glory be unto our most loving Heavenly Father and to His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm thinking this is a preface to the translation. With the Holy Ghost proceeding from them both. Ah, double procession. What are we going to do with that there? I guess Constantinople will choke. I don't know what they're still talking about there. It's practically there's going to be no healing of that, I don't think. Unless we descend even further into doctrinal indifferentism. These are days so open the eyes of the world that not only the juggling slates of the Romish Babylon <laughs> be so truly espised that they can no longer deceive and hear most cruel tyranny so vanquished 
that she may now no longer reign in Christian people's consciences as she hath by goddess God's sufferance for our sinfulness many long years doing. Neither is it possible that the exceeding mercy and favor of God towards the, the realm of England may more evidently appear than it is by these two tokens following declared. The one that hath pleased him by his most puissant and mightful arm to deliver us out of the bondage of this Romish Egypt. Fair passing the yokes and servitude which the children of Israel suffered under Pharaoh and the other, that of his especial grace he hath vouchsafed to open our hearts that we may see the truth and to give unto this realm the right knowledge concerning this most holy sacrament which the subtle and crafty illusion of Satan by the instrument of the said purpurate whore of Babylon, purpurate means purple, hath made of the most pure fountain of water sprinkling up unto everlasting life, a foul stinking puddle of idolatry. Now, you got to think, Tudor England, a stinking puddle, I think Cranmer uses it somewhere, the front part of the house on the second deck was kind of out a little bit and you filled your chamber pots up at night, you know, urine and excrement, you know, as a case, rather than go out in the cold wind or rain. And then in the morning you walk to the front and pour it out. And that's a stinking puddle. It's a very graphic Tudor term of idolatry and superstition to endless damnation of a most precious and heaven jewel. And it may be, uh, it may be that it's here that Richard Hooker, a more deliberative approach, um, extracts or pulls back from the vile and vitriol of some of the language, perhaps a vile and devilish abomination. And on the other hand, you know, you hold it up and they're, they're bread worshipers. They're making God. They're Christ creators. Another incarnation, as it were. And you know, they're responsible for a lot of bowings and scrapings and really a, a denial of the real presence of Christ. You have to wait until tomorrow till he shows up again because, you know, he's kind of half gone until you go, come to the next mass. It's all in the power of the hands of the papist priest. How do we how do we work out here in modernity? Pray and think about it. Illuminating the hearts of the same most glad and cheerfully to embrace the gospel and giving us to king such a godly, I say, I think it's Josiah. I don't know. This can't be King. This can't be King Edward. Maybe is this is in tender years of childhood. Okay, maybe it is Edward the Sixth. Neither forgetteth nor ceaseth with most fearful advice and trusty assistance of his most notable and sapient counselors to something and swell the word of God may be sincerely and purely set forth and taught taught unto his most dear beloved subjects. So when did uh, his he write on this on the sacrament? It came up allegedly at Oxford. He lectured on Romans <laughs> that's sure to shake things up and first Corinthians and that he would exegete along and exposit out along, and then when it comes to you know the eleventh chapter, go off on a you know a tangent on the hot points. Same in Romans, and that created some hate and discontent, is my understanding, up at Oxford. So this this may be rather contemporaneous in Edward's time. It sounds it, and for as much as the whole process of this discourse is both consonant unto the word of God, that it cannot be doubted, but that it is true and also just 
agreeing with the king's majesty's most godly proceedings that the people may by reading and hearing of hereof be truly satisfied and persuaded universally to embrace and follow the other. I think, as I've said, a work right expedient and necessary to be had in the English tongue as well for the instruction of such good as can read and also for the help of some good persons and curates, which though they have a good zeal and forwardness to set forth the King's Majesty's most Christian proceedings, yet for default of sufficient learning, the more is the piety, are not of themselves able, neither truly, to instruct. The only time I heard the word truly was my dad. Never hear that, truly. To instruct the flock of all the truth, nor to satisfy the ignorant in such doubtful cases or questions as may haply arse at about this matter, or finally to stop the mouths of the seditious papists, <laughs> or of such as are malicious and inveterate enemies against the pure doctrine of Christ's gospel. And although in treating of such high matters it cannot be avoided, but that by reason of some school terms or arguments there must needs be many things that may seem to pass the capacity and understanding of the unlettered sort. Yet it is not such a notable good work as this discourse of Peter Martyr, or has his disputations upon the same matter, therefore be suppressed or kept hidden under the bushel. For no book should be set forth, but such as every body, yea, even of the unlearned and gross multitude. Thank you. You take care of the people. Old New Testament systematic church history, practical theology. You bring it out to help the people in the pew. The minister exists for the pew, not the people in the pew for the minister. That's a big difference. You are a servant of your people. And yes, I'm being dogmatic about that. Thank you for your tolerant indulgence. And what would Chaucer, Gore, Lydgate, and others do abroad, whom some even of the learned sort do in some place scarcely take, than were it in vain to set forth chronicles or statutes, in which is both a great number of words and also much mat matter not easy to be perceived by everybody, than it were a labor loss to set forth forth in the English books of something and homilies under the gross and rustical multitude that he is not able to conceive that is in them contained, then were in vain to have translated or set forth the Bible in English to the vulgar people. I'm wondering how contemporaneous this is with the publication of Vermigli on the Lord's Supper. And I don't know if it's going to be this guy talking all the time about Vermigli, or whether it's, is it really Vermigli per se. It's claiming to be the date of 1550. That's what we have by way of provenance. Um, you yeah, know, Stephen Gardner's in the background eating this stuff up, and Cranmer and Gardner are back and forth. So let's, I'm hoping this is actually Vermigli. What we're getting here is a translator's commentary. And I would venture to say if this was a preface published in 1550, would it have the Archbishop's seal? I don't know what the procedure of publication was back then. Alas. <laughs> And like is without any reading or hearing at all, they should continue ever more blind and ignorant. You know, there we go, practical theology. If we learn nothing else, you know, this is important, the Eucharistic presence is the imperative necessity of giving the people the finest cuisine that the clergyman can muster, bring to them. So that, you know, they're busy. 
you know, my family's out doing this, that, and the other, food, shopping, medical appointments, fixing cars, going to work, raising kids. They can't sit around all day and read books. So my, does that mean I'm better than them? No. I mean, yeah, I'm better in theology, but no, I exist for them. The academics exist for the people. I'm afraid too often I've got some concerns about a couple scholars. Loser connect, and that one of which is Tom Wright. Just an abundance of words. He's gone off the deep end on original sin and justification completely. Does it li exists in a bubble? I don't know. I get some real concerns. Uh, but that's for another time, another day. And I kind of times wonder about Jim Packer. Love him to death, followed his writings, listened to him, heard him many times. But on the ECT matter, he really, compared to where he was before, it's hard to know. Did he lose touch with the people? And he never was, he never accepted correction from some really competent people. He doubled down, came hard hearted. Sad. And I still pray every day for Mrs. Packer. You know, Jim left, what, two, three, four weeks ago. Well, at any rate, um, let me call it a day here on this. We're just opening it up. We'll be pondering Peter Vermiglii on the Lord's Supper. Again, old, new, systematics, church history, practical theology, and contemporary theology which knows nothing very about atonement issues. That's a heresy in some, some quarters. Anyways, enough. Thank you for listening. <clears throat> Verse 3 of hymn 95. To you in David's town this day is born of David's line, the Savior who is the Christ, and this shall be the sign. Let us pray. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, through the Holy Spirit, our Comforter. May he abide with us now and always. Amen. Godspeed.